I'm going to leave it to Chris Johnson to hopefully help us with the objective of uh, predicting the certainty of uncertain change because I don't feel like I hit that objective that you laid out, Elaine. So uh, it's up to you, Chris. Thanks. Thanks, John. I'm going to turn things over now to our last presenter, Christopher Johnson. And just as a reminder to the audience, you can type in your questions in the questions box at any point, and we will read them all at the end. Well, thank you so much, um, Elaine and, and John. That's a, a really great segue there. Um, I am going to take, um, as John suggested, a, a different approach, and I'm going to take um, take a, a familiar saying uh, from George uh, Santayana um, of those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So what I'm going to do is um, on an overarching level I'd like to highlight or point out a common assumption that happens when we talk about things like model-based and uh, digital project delivery. And that is I'd like to separate the verb from the noun of this conversation. Um, there is, on, on one hand, the functionality and operation of what this technology that we're referring to of BIM um, delivers. So there's the functionality and operation portion of it. And then there's also the form and the processes um, which embody or are used to deliver that. Um, so the question that I, I guess I want to, to put out in front of you and have in your, the back of your minds as you're hearing what I'm sharing um, this afternoon is the question of is an industry-wide unified data standard required in order to deliver the value which follows from a unified project team and the unity and cohesion of those data assets that John had mentioned when he talked about um, a delivery uh, versus O&M assets. So, uh, what I'm going to first do is I'll start with sharing uh, a bit of my story as it pertains to this topic of data standards. And then I'm going to share with you a few project examples that demonstrate um, some of the key lessons which looking back in time can tell us about what's ahead. And then lastly, I want to highlight two very simple yet profound takeaways which I believe can help answer to the question in your individual organizations of the what, when, why, how um, of data standards to select for your organization's data assets. So I'm just going to jump right into my story. Uh, the year is 1983 right here in this picture and I'm six years old. Um, my dad and I are lounging on our olive green shag carpet watching an episode of Different Strokes on our color tube TV. Going straight from high school into the Marines, uh, my father didn't graduate college until 1980. And once he did, he got a job as a mechanical designer and drafter for Newport News Shipbuilding. During this time, his first exposure to computers was at a special machinery plant in 1982, and that was an Intergraph mainframe. As he described it to me, it was a large room filled with gigantic 12-inch diameter spinning reels. Uh, in 1985, his department transitioned from board drafting to a single IBM CADM mainframe. So that's 1983. So what I'm showing here now, uh, if you note on the right hand of your screen, um, a few uh, data visualizations um, that look at the amount of RAM uh, in the machines that were being used, the cost of memory, um, the hard drive capacity, and the uh, central processing unit speed. And we can see how that's going to change um, just over the short time frame from essentially um, middle school through today. So it's 1989 in this picture. I'm 12 years old. My brother's about 10 with me, and we're playing on a computer that my dad bought us. It was a, a 286, and that, that machine cost over $2,000. It was running AutoCAD version 10 
on a DOS operating system. There, there was a turbo button on it, which uh, um, maybe some of you can chuckle with me here and remember that you could push this button and it would send a, a speedy 16 megahertz machine to a, a turbo 20 megahertz. Uh, it had one megabyte of RAM, and that megabyte sold for $50 per megabyte. Its hard drive held 20 megabytes. Uh, my brother and I learned to do CAD by drawing cars and army vehicles for fun. Uh, we had a dial-up modem at the time, and it could access what was called bulletin boards. Um, for those of you on the call who don't not familiar with that term. It's essentially an online uh, chatting and file sharing. I am here in this picture proudly, uh, proudly holding up a Merry Christmas family message and an ASCII Christmas tree that I typed into my new TI-82. It's 1993 and at 16 I got a part-time job working on a 486 machine which ran Windows NT. AutoCAD version 12 was running on a 16 megabytes of RAM machine, which now cost $30 per megabyte. Hard drives could hold up to 250 megabytes of data, uh, which was over 10 times what they could just a few years ago. And you could access the internet with the Mosaic web browser. It's the first graphical interface of its kind. I turned 21 in 1999, and while in college, I worked part-time converting paper shop drawings to 2D and 3D AutoCAD files. The Windows 98 operating system was running AutoCAD version 2000 now, and uh, it was operating on 400 megahertz processor. It contained 64 megabytes of RAM, which now cost only a dollar a megabyte, and zip drives could now help archive and transport up to 250 megabytes of data. At this time, we were using Netscape browser to surf the web uh, with Ask Jeeves and Yahoo. In 2001, uh, that's when I earned my BS in mechanical engineering. And uh, being in the successful rock band Jacob Stone, as I'm sure everybody's aware of, uh, I decided to stay in the CAD and technology path so I wouldn't get too tied down uh, with a ME career, you know, so I, I needed to keep touring. I transitioned from working primarily in AutoCAD 2000 on a mechanical um, micro to a microstation version 7 on civil work. Uh, our Windows 2000 machines now held a 1 gigahertz uh, CPU. Uh, which had 128 megabytes of RAM, uh, which cost 50 cents per megabyte now, and it stored 20 gigabytes internally. Uh, this was a screamer, and we could now store 700 megabytes on rewritable CDs. This added capacity really came in handy um, to save our 2D design files that could contain up to 4 billion units in its design plane and uh, 256 levels. I was now Googling the web to find printers because um, I, I needed to find a printer capable of printing the 11 by 17 copies of the deliverable plan set. Um, in order to print this, it, it cost us $7,000 at the time to print one set of deliverables. At 27, I became the CAD manager for the largest transportation project in the history of Wisconsin, the Marquette Interchange Project. We upgraded to Windows XP and underwent the enormous task of transitioning tens of thousands of design files from V7 to V8. Uh, many people were not happy, you know, despite the fact that we had 512 megabytes of RAM in 3 gigahertz machines. Uh, with USB ports and nearly limitless levels and design plane. I remember feeling quite empowered when I convinced my project manager to fund a one gigabyte USB drive to transport files between project offices. That 
little one gigahertz uh, or one gigabyte USB stick cost seventy dollars at the time. Uh, now you can find them for free at uh, exhibit booths. Uh, thankfully, our printing process um, and expenses had gone down since we only had to print one of the five thousand page plan sets. Um, and that was thanks to the awesome new PDF submittal process, which was super high tech at the time. So in this picture here, I'm standing next to um, the cumulative set of all of the different legs of that, um, and that weighs there over uh, 200 pounds. So by 2010, um, I had served as the lead technologist for the last two Wisconsin mega projects, and at the, for the first time in 2010, I was asked to quote unquote do BIM on a portion of the $2 billion uh, I-94 North-South Corridor project. The Windows 7 update that uh, that year did cause a bit of a headache. Um, some of the software no longer worked on the 64-bit machines. However, 8 gigabytes of RAM, which now only cost a penny a megabyte, you know, think about that compared to $50 um, just several years ago on dual 3 gigahertz processors. This, this was a welcome upgrade. Also a very welcome upgrade was MicroStation uh, V8i Select Series 2. Uh, this enabled materials, lighting, rendering, animation um, in, a, in a head and shoulders way uh, better, than, better than before. I could now also export to Google Earth seamlessly. Um, as well as easily handle reprojection between files. You know, this was something that would take uh, days um, to do previously between files. Now it could be done in just a, just a few minutes. Uh, this was huge. Um, what was also huge was the headache that some of the roadway modelers got from the newer version of inroads being incompatible with previous versions. Uh, this meant recreating geometry and settings files. Uh, by this time now, USB, FTP, and cloud-based solutions made file transfers mostly a, a non-issue. So since working with the Wisconsin Department of Transportation on developing and implementing 3D modeling technologies, you know, things that we refer to as BIM, SIM, VDC, I've been invent, invited to present case studies every year since uh, 2011. Um, every year I've had more and new things to report, you know, more utilization of the technology, new applications, unexpected opportunities. Uh, what started as experimental pilot project reviews in 2010 have now become scheduled contractual model-based reviews. Uh, this table that I'm sharing with you here is from data that's been tracked uh, from one of the recent clash detection review processes. And what I'm highlighting here is a estimate of over $600,000 um, worth of costs that are associated with not doing these reviews. These are the costs um, associated with if we would not do this model-based um, clash detection review, uh, how much for just one review uh, would we be potentially looking at? And so even though this uh, is applying to a large $200 million construction project, um, on the other hand, this is only one of um, several new practices and new standards that are have been in place. So this takes us to the present, where I'm now working on um, the fourth very large uh, Wisconsin project. And this project that I'm now working on is expected to be the last of its kind done in MicroStation after 25 years of WisDOT using Bentley applications. Uh, see, in 19, uh, I'm sorry, in, in 2007, WisDOT's method development team selected Civil 3D as its design software to replace the Bentley platform that was used in 1990. Okay, so with that story time over, you know, how many of you have a story like this? How many of you are laughing 
as you saw these pictures and uh, as you see these pictures before you. Um, each of you um, share a very similar long and winding technological story that's led to where we're at today. If you can remember beta and VHS, laser discs and CDs, Fortran and punch cards, you know the one constant over the last 30 years of digital technology. Change. Um, exponential change and unpredictable change. So what's this have to do with digital design data standards? Well, I suggest to you it's got everything to do with uh, data standards. I suggest to you that the best strategy for capitalizing on your data assets these assets that are as valuable as real estate, is to expect this change and to plan for it. Uh, the data standards that brought the world VHS were an essential step in the journey through floppies, CDs, and USB drives. But just as they were an essential step, they're also, it's essential that they became obsolete. Uh, it was essential that the data standard of its time became obsolete and made way for the next phase in the diffusion of innovation. So I like to think about this um, with a, a, a analogy or metaphor, you know, like a pickaxe that you'd use when you're climbing a mountain. And you stick that pickaxe into the wall. Its application is a necessary part of your climb, and its removal is an equally necessary part of that climb. So where does this leave us? Um, do we simply, you know, resolve to riding whichever data standard wave comes next and hop off what's become familiar to us just at a whim? Not at all. Um, I want to share with you a few things. Uh, a first thought is that not all standards are equal. And secondly, that not all projects are equally affected by those standards. So I'm going to explain both of those with a few project examples. Uh, first to highlight not all projects um, are equally affected by standards, I want to talk about uh, New Mexico 44. Uh, this is a project that uh, my project manager, um, Mike Paddock, that I've, I've worked for the last uh, three or four mega, uh, mega projects in Wisconsin, uh, he shared with me. Now, when I asked Mike about um, how this project was was making out, um, uh, he shared with me that he couldn't tell me exactly uh, where they were at with their performance, but they were, they were very happy. Let, let me back up a step and just share with you a few um, key points about this, this project. Um, it was a project that was done, uh, a P3, as we, we call it, uh, a public and private partnership, and it was done by a very innovative project manage, manager with a very tight budget. Um, the approach that the, the winning firm took on this project um, was to hire a lot of PhDs um, as opposed to hire a lot of pavement repairs. And what they did was they collected data in a centralized location, a centralized GIS location, uh, during design, during construction, and then that was leveraged through O&M. And by using predictive analyses, uh, they were able to save um, such a significant amount of money as to reap the benefits within uh, that budget. And so a key takeaway here is that they use proactive preventative maintenance through collecting and leveraging this data uh, versus reactive repair maintenance. Um, that's, what, uh, that's what I was referring to when I mentioned that you know, hiring uh, PhDs to analyze the data that was collected versus hiring additional pavement repairs to fix everything. Um, and so, in this example, um, it's it's an it's a case 
where it would matter very little what data standards we used, but it was more important that a standard was, uh, was used. And one of the key characteristics here is that it had one single benefactor organization over the entire life cycle of the project. Um, and that provided both the incentive to invest and also the means uh, to return on that investment. The second project example um, that I want to share with you is from the Zoo Interchange project, a project that I've um, recently uh, worked on. It's now in construction. Uh, this is a $1.7 billion interchange project. And it's a, a project that has been utilizing portions of what the BIM or SIM uh, technology has to offer, uh, primarily in clash detection. And so I want to share with you just one very interesting workflow um, example from design construction. So what you're looking at here in this picture is um, a screen capture of one of the staged SIM model deliverables. Um, as you can see, it contains existing ground. Um, it contains uh, existing facilities, such as utilities, uh, as well as then all of the proposed features that are part of the project. Um, you can see some existing right-of-way that's shown, uh, proposed bridges, roadway. Now, uh, one of the facets to delivering this was that there was a team that was just responsible for QCing and um, to check and to deliver a very highly accurate and um, high quality AMG, automated machine grading surface, in, in order to be delivered to the contractors on the job. Now, I'm going to share with you here on the bottom of your screen um, a little snippet of how that workflow went. Um, it's kind of convoluted, as you can see, and, and, and complicated. What started with uh, data in a 2D DGM file, um, from that there was horizontal and vertical alignments generated, and then uh, that's the ALG and the ITL there, and then a DTM, uh, 3D surfaces. Now those files were then used to generate uh, the production or the deliverable sheets into another set of DGNs. Uh, that set of DGNs was used to produce a set of PDFs that was stamped and delivered to the contractor as the contractual deliverable. Um, that being the vehicle, uh, the contractual vehicle to deliver the design intent, uh, once that was QC'd and reviewed, there was now TML, paramodeler files, and models, surface models, that were generated by a team to produce those AMG surfaces. Once they did that, um, in order to deliver the contractual, uh, contractually specified electronic standards of the client, um, it needed to be translated into an XML file, an XML file that had all of the very specific and accurate um, triangulated face, faces or triangles or shapes, um, as well as the break lines that had names on them. Um, now those needed to be used in order to materialize the surfaces. So that was part of the contractual deliverable, to be able to discern the driving lane uh, versus the barrier versus walls versus grading. And those materialized surfaces then needed to be delivered into a, a DWG file an AutoCAD um, or Autodesk Civil 3D model. So, okay, that was quite a mouthful to to go over, but, you know, you can see how that, that demonstrates um, quite an involved process. Um, now, here, one of the things that was uh, used in order to actually deliver and follow through this process was a custom XML parser. So if we look here all the way at the end of the chain here, 
where, where the XML comes in. Um, that had all of the accurate data, but neither the current Autodesk platform uh, nor the current um, Bentley platform uh, were natively able to import all of the data with all of its attributes um, that were required in order to materialize it according to the contract deliverable, uh, the contract scope. So, you know, that, that leaves us at, at a, a little bit of a, a loss. Um, however, because the data was in an XML format, a format that was documented so that I could go and look up um, how that standard was used, um, and it was also accessible, um, I was able to create a custom XML parser that uh, I could get the data that I needed. I could ask it the questions I needed to ask it, get the data I needed, and then uh, do some automation in order to output into the correct format. So what I'd like to do is highlight uh, two important uh, conclusions that I've drawn from um, both these project examples as well as um, many, many others throughout um, the last 15 years of my career. The first being in removing familiar standards. Uh, this is going to be uncomfortable um, because all of the data standards that are currently used by your entire, entire design team, uh, when removing standards, it, it uh, you know, by its very nature is going to be disruptive and be uncomfortable. Um, however, you know, not taking the next step in order to uh, put in the data standards required to hold the yet unknown, more robust data is, uh, is extremely important in order for your assets to continue to carry forward and continue to be leveraged and return value. Um, and connected to this, it's, you know, if, if you wait for definitive proof um, of, of the ROI, um, if you've waited long enough for that, you'll be left behind um, because it is only by taking some risk and doing something in your organizations um, to leverage data that's currently not being leveraged, um, it's only by taking those risks moving forward that you'll be able to realize the benefit. Uh, the next piece that I want to highlight is in regards to applying the new standards, um, the how to apply the standards or what to look for. And so, you know, if, if there's anything that we can learn from what I've shared, uh, it's to expect obsolescence. Um, and then I want to uh, propose to you a few things about selecting your standards. And I'm, I'm calling this a performance-based specification for standards. Um, the first is that it's documented. Um, perhaps even if it's not open source. At the very least, if the data standard that you select to house your data assets, if it's documented, um, that gives uh, everybody in uh, all, the, sh all the, the stakeholders in the project, uh, private and public, um, as you know, this, this includes um, academia and other folks uh, who would add to the conversation of more robust ways to leverage the data. If it's not documented, um, it hamstrings uh, all of our ability to know what's there. Uh, secondly, it's um, got to be accessible. Um, so proprietary uh, data structures, uh, proprietary data formats, um, 
really get in the way of accessing uh, data uh, 5, 10, you know, 20 years down the road where you cannot find um, licenses or find even versions of the software that were used to initially author that data um, in order for it to be uh, accessible uh, means being able to carry it forward. And then lastly, um, comprehensive. And, uh, you know, admittedly, this would have to be taken um, with a grain of salt, or maybe it's better to say comprehensive to what your, at least, at, at the very least, your current expectations. Um, so when comparing uh, various data standards, um, taking into consideration one data standard's ability to house more of the data um, facets, attributes, um, that you currently expect to be used uh, should weigh into which of those standards is going to be the best to, to return on that investment in the future. So with that, I'll uh, turn it back over to Elaine. Uh, Thank you for your attention.